I believe that when the history of our times is written, uh, the history of humankind is written, we will be seen as among the most cruel periods in human history, the total breakdown of solidarity. There are large numbers of people, first you don't even have homes. Where will they stay during this period? How will they lock themselves down? If 10 people are sharing, say, a one room, small one room set, and 150 uh, people share one toilet, how are they ever going to social distance? The Prime Minister didn't seem to be concerned about that. He said, uh, everyone should keep washing their hands. It does he not know you just have to go out every morning and see outside slums, 10 rupees, 20 rupees to get these two or three pots of water. Everything they have done has shown that some lives are valuable and must be protected. And some lives, a much larger number of lives, are entirely dispensable. The government will take no responsibility for them. The migrants, finally, when they had nothing at all, uh, they began to walk. And you know, please remember, this is the biggest distress movement of populations in human history, except for uh, the slaves being taken from Africa. I mean, that I calculated was larger. But it was even bigger than partition. You know, this should have shaken us to our core. And, and it happened because the, Nine out of ten workers have no protection of any kind. To invite this absolutely scintillating panel, uh, uh, the least of uh, the qualifications of everybody here is that they're very dear friends and people uh, whose work I admire greatly. Um, but for, for, for the kind of scope of the discussion that we propose to have today, uh, which is not just about uh, either the virus, the pandemic, uh, but about the suffering that uh, that was ensued by public policy choices, unprecedented in scale uh, in human history, uh, and in, with the cruelty with which it was implemented, but also the endorsement of all of this by most sections of India's middle class and what it reveals about all of us. Um, and uh, moderating our discussion is Gita Hariharan, uh, who uh, uh, heads the India Cultural Forum, uh, is one of our most noted voices in uh, literature in, in the country today. Uh, and uh, 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 I mean, I, I also love uh, the way that she responds to contemporary crises with fiction uh, that makes you think a lot uh, uh, and see and understand the world very differently. Uh, we have uh, Vinay Lal here, who's uh, uh, a very, again, a very, very erudite and very original uh, thinker, a historian. Uh, and he has looked at, uh, he's, he's, he's written the first book I have seen on, uh, you know, on, globally about uh, about the context of, of, of the pandemic and, uh, and uh, state and societal responses. Uh, but he writes on, he's, he, he, his mind is, is constantly, he, you know, he, he can write on popular culture, on Indian cinema, on the, on, on the diaspora, uh, and uh, on uh, very fine set of essays on uh, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, and that covers just a small part of his, uh, his uh, the range that he covers. Uh, uh, we have Neera 
Chandok, uh, who's, uh, who we are very proud but is the least of her accomplishments that she's the first distinguished fellow of the Center for Equity Studies. Uh, she's again a political scientist uh, listened to with great respect. Uh, and uh, she has been working with us and for us about the importance of what, what many of us call civil society, but also of uh, dissent and how central it is uh, uh, for a society, for a democracy. Uh, and then last but not least is Hilal Ahmed. Hilal uh, is uh, you know, among younger political uh, sociologists and social scientists he's listened to with great respect. Uh, once again, uh, there's uh, ordinarity, uh, there's uh, provocation, uh, but there is evidence and, and deep insight in, uh, in his analysis of, of this very troubled period in the history of our democracy. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, Anirban, uh, you all just heard. Uh, Anirban, I'm very proud, is one of our, uh, our, our scholars in the Center for Equity Studies. Uh, but uh, he has, he's been a very strong young voice uh, of political dissent. Uh, and he combines uh, great courage with, uh, with, a, with a deeply compassionate personality. And, uh, and then, of course, we have Natasha. Uh, and uh, Natasha Badwar is a, is a wonderful writer, very popular columnist and filmmaker. Uh, and uh, she was one of those who volunteered to join uh, the Karwane Mahobat, responding to hate uh, more than three years ago. And she never left. And in fact, uh, in this turbulent period, uh, she and her young colleagues have been talking about hate violence. They're talking about people living the alternative of uh, love and solidarity, uh, the anti-CAA protests, the, uh, uh, the communal violence in Delhi. For each of these, there are 50, 60, 70 films. Uh, that they keep producing. Uh, and I think they will be part of a, a contemporary record of our history in these troubled times. And now the farmers' protests uh, and what they uh, stand for in our society. So, uh, so this is really the panel here. Ravi, unfortunately, we're not hearing. Ravi has been my editor for almost 20 years. I, I have moved with him. Uh, where he moves because I have great trust in him. Many people rate him to be uh, perhaps the best of our editors. And, uh, and he's also grown into a very dear friend. He particularly believed in this book, uh, and, uh, which I wrote while we were on the streets almost from the second or third day, because uh, I could not bear uh, to remain silent after what I was witness to. And uh, I, I started off with 20,000 words and Ravi told me that this is a book that he believes will be read 50 years from now and he would personally edit every word of it. And so much of the book is actually the result of conversations we had over the next two or three months. Uh, and it grew to 66,000 words. And uh, I, I hope we can see him and hear him uh, before the afternoon is over or the morning or the evening. Uh, so over to my dear friend Gita to take it up from here. Thank you, Harsh. Um, thank you, all of you, um, for joining us today to discuss this book. I think it's quite clear that this book is not about COVID. It's not about the pandemic. But the pandemic is very much there as a sort of springboard to look at a range of issues from shortcomings uh, in planning, um, the failure to include uh, people who are affected. Um, and if I put it in a, a, a slightly more harsh way, uh, the book actually, the pandemic as well, holds up a, a kind of unforgiving mirror to the structures that have made it possible 
for what Harsh describes in the book to happen, which is um, a, a callous, uncaring planning, not including the bulk of people, uh, and even worse, sections of the people who don't see um, other people, sometimes when they see them, they actively scapegoat them. So in a way, the mirror seems to tell us that this is the unequal and unjust way we live. And we have a panel with us today to discuss one year later, almost to the day when the sudden lockdown was announced, to look at what are the ways in which we live that make such events possible, both at the level of the state, the various tiers of state agencies and institutions, as well as the general public, which is, of course, a mythical creature, especially in, in um, a society as divided as ours. I thought we'd begin, I know we're going to focus on the middle class, but I really thought that we should begin with a framework issue, which is that many of the problems that Harsh outlines, um, the effects of which we continue to see today, a year later, is that the lockdown was essentially viewed as a law and order problem and not as a public health um, crisis because a public health crisis would naturally involve people who are affected. So if I may begin with um, Vinay, you know, with this framework of, of the law and order problem, which means that you use laws and rules and privilege those, um, I couldn't help, uh, you know, thinking of the colonial state, the colonial admin template uh, throughout and the way in which uh, the, the Diseases Act was used then, uh, the way in which uh, citizens were sort of reduced to subjects who needed to be kept orderly. So your thoughts on that, perhaps, Vinay? Yeah, uh, uh, thank you, Geeta, for... Uh what is actually a very probing question to begin with. Uh, let me also begin by expressing my thanks, of course, to uh, the Center for Equity Studies, uh, NewsClick, um, and Speaking Tiger, and everyone else who's been associated with making this event possible. Um, with respect to your question, uh, Geeta, uh, I think your, your uh, uh, and, and Hirsch, uh, because Hirsch had mentioned this, I, uh, you know, in the book, uh, sometimes explicitly, I think it's more tacit there in some ways, which is the argument, namely the, the one that you have now invoked, Gita, namely that, uh, that if you look at the Indian state, uh, the Indian state essentially has taken this to be a law and order problem uh, rather than a public health issue. Of course, I mean, one could say that they have taken almost everything to be a law and order problem. Uh, uh, COVID is only one of the more dramatic illustrations of that particular tendency. So we might describe this as a law and order state to begin with. Uh, I think that the best way to resolve it, because, you know, I mean, as someone who has worked on colonial India for a long time, I, I can certainly see the point of view that is emerging over here. Uh, and I would subscribe to it. But I would suggest that perhaps we can even actually uh, take a, 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 a cognate framework but which would put it in a slightly, a slightly larger context, which is that I think we have to try to understand what is the relationship of Indians to the state? What do they think of the state? What does the state really mean? And historically, of course, the problem, one of the problems has been what is the way in which the state has actually appeared to average Indians? Now, there was an old colonial argument, I mean, in a curious way, one doesn't have to subscribe to Orientalism, but you can see this argument surfacing in the very figure of our prime minister. I mean, remember that one of the things that he wants to do is he wants to create a new capital. I mean, he's a little bit like Muhammad Tughlaq, if I may put it this way, you know, you, you sort of vacate the city metaphorically in this case, and you build a new capital. 
you know, call it Modi Abad or whatever you want to call it, right? Uh, the issue here is this, that for a very long period of time, the state has always appeared very distant. When it does appear, it appears almost invariably as a law and order problem. I mean, I always used to wonder watching Hindi films uh, made in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, why is it that the police always arrived too late, right? This, the, what is the relationship, in other words, of the state to the average Indian? I think that that's one very large question that emerges from it. The law and order part of it is a subset of it, uh, because of course it's quite obvious that that the Indian state still uses in many ways uh, a colonial framework. I mean, the, the diseases, epidemic diseases act has been mentioned, but remember that, I mean, a large number of people being hauled in today are being hauled in under something called the Sedition Act. I mean, I, and you know, I don't have the time to go over the whole history of this Sedition Act, but I wrote my doctoral dissertation 30 years ago on the whole issue of law and order and how that was in fact the narrative framework that the colonial state had fundamentally used. So I think that, so I think that very briefly speaking, I think that that is an issue, but when we come to the whole issue of public health, the problem here is not particular to India. And in fact, I would say that I would, I would want to add one thing here as a possible point of discussion uh, with reference to the whole book is that I think we have to ask what is particular to India and what isn't. Because many of the problems that Harsha has talked about and addressed, and he makes the argument, which I accept in, in some part, but not entirely, that that uh, and and that is the extent to which this problem is particular to India, or the or the extent to which it has been highly aggravated, okay, under the present circumstances, under the present political dispensation uh, in India. Because again, we find that the tendency to take it as a law and order problem is actually very pervasive. If you had to look at the pandemic in a white context. One of the fundamental questions is, what is the position of the state relative to civil society? Almost in every country of the world, including democratic nations, the state has been strengthened by the pandemic. And almost in every country, the pandemic has been used as a pretext to actually repress the population, including countries such as Norway, you'd be surprised to hear, which introduced one of the most intrusive apps. And, they, and it was finally withdrawn after a widespread protest. Okay, so, so we would have to ask what is really particular to India. And then within that framework, we'd have to ask two questions, what, which is to what extent is it that the law and order paradigm has been used here and in what particular ways rather than addressing this as a public health issue, because obviously if you look at the migrant laborers, it was not addressed as a public health issue. If it had been, the, the whole lockdown and the way in which it was enforced wouldn't have actually happened at all, uh, because the very way it was done and ensured that the virus would spread. That's obviously the argument that some people have advanced, right? And But then the second would have to do with, with the relationship of Indians to something we call the state. So that's very briefly my response. Thank you. That's actually, um, you know, going on from there, Vinay has referred to the relationship of um, citizens to the state, Indian citizens to the state. Um, of course, at some point, maybe we can come back to the old uh, paternalistic Maibap Sarkar um, idea. But Neera, I was wondering, what about the relationship of various tiers of the state? Um, now, the Disaster Management Act, which is our version of the, um, uh, the Colonial Epidemic uh, Disease Act, um, does it really allow for um, the, what shall I say, responsibilities being decentralized? Because one of the problems we saw in the lockdown was that almost everything was top down. So two levels of problems um, that I'm hoping we'll address. One is that, um, that though we have different state bodies, local level bodies, that it was really the central government uh, dec deciding for every region and locality, as if to say that a lockdown 
all over would make sense. Um, that is one, the, the uh, top-down approach. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is who was doing the planning? Even the bureaucracy was only looking at the middle class. But if we could start with this, this business of uh, the federal structure not really being made use of. Yeah, thank you, Gita. Uh, you know, I think Harsh's book is important not only because it moves you tremendously, mm -hmm. and it's probably going to be a primary document on the pandemic for years to come. So thank you, Harsh. I won't say congratulations because it makes, um, it makes me feel stupid that I'm part of this middle class. But there come a, comes a moment in the life of every society when you cast an unrelenting gaze upon yourself and says, what have we become? Uh, you're right, Gita, so just to answer. Uh, you know, there has been a centralization of power for the last seven years now in the office of the prime minister. And of course, the, under the label of the cult of the leader, <clears throat> with the result that local authorities have been stripped of their autonomy and their capacity to judge what people need and aspire and desire for. The whole process of representation has been hijacked in the process, but I'll come back to the issue of representation. But there is a more fundamental issue, which I think Hush's book and his colleagues, because I think they had a lot to do with the making of this uh, wonderful uh, very poignant work. There are three issues which I think the book throws up and this might have something to do with the question you asked me, not directly, but uh, you know, this is a symptom. It was not a one in a, a one in a mil hundred years event. This was a symptom of a generalized indifference to the poor. And this, it, three sorts of causes can be attributed, which allowed actually not only indifference, but also sanctioning of the most despotic uh, policies that were enunciated at a time when period was, when people were starving, starved of food and of water. I cannot uh, but help remember my shock when the finance minister came on television, instead of talking about concrete issues, such as giving everybody some money, they talked about a perspective in the future. But let us look behind. See, in the 1990s, the global policy community led by the World Bank started focusing on poverty eradication and national governments followed suit. Now, just eradicating poverty is not the issue. Uh, because to be poor is not only to be denied of the basic precondition that allow you to live a life of dignity, the poor do not have voice, apart from the elections, where they have the vote, they don't have voice, they don't have access to the multiple transactions of society. That means the poor are not only poor, they're also unequal. And the whole focus on inequality, which should be very much a part of our political discourse, after all, equality is part of our preamble, has been neutralized by this relentless focus by the policy and the development community on poverty eradication. It is what we in philosophy circles call sufficientarianism. You know, Harry Frankfurt said, give the poor enough to eat, how does it matter that they are unequal? The problem is when somebody is poor, you are not looking at them as equal. When you don't look at them as equal, the politics of indifference arises from that. There were middle class, uh, you know, uh, colonies where whose uh, RWA started providing food. That's not the issue. They looked at it as charity. Now, charity, I think, is actually dense self-respect. And we should dispense with the whole notion of charity and start thinking of sharing. So in a way, you know, this relentless indifference to inequality and the focus on just giving the poor enough to eat creates conditions when they neither are equal nor do they have enough to eat because you're just indifferent to them. And this is 94% of our working class that produces labor. The whole issue is therefore a class issue. And I think Hush's book makes it very clear that it was not the middle classes who could afford to live in their own homes who could practice social distancing. 
the poor just couldn't do so. They couldn't even get access to clean water. They couldn't even get access to water to, to wash their hands. Now, who were they mandating for? Who was the government legislating for? And the shocking extent of inequality becomes very clear when Oxfam releases its report at Davos this January. It said Indian billionaires increased their wealth by 35% to 3 trillion during the lockdown. And this is the inequality virus report. And the rise in fortunes of the top 100 billionaires is enough to give every one of the 138 million poorest Indian people a check of 94,000 per person. What happened to our debates on progressive taxation? What happened to our focus on seeing that people, you know, it's just not to say wipe a tear from every eye, give everybody enough to eat. It is, it's say we are a political community. We entered into a contract with the state on 26 January 1950, but we also entered into a contract with each other. That is, if somebody's dignity has been eroded, if somebody is going hungry, if people are walking with bloated and distended bellies and throats parched for lack of water and calluses on their feet, the collective conscience of humankind should be shaken. I hope it was shaken, but then it kind of retreated into the background and this class aspect of the pandemic remains unexplored. Everybody talks of giving them enough to eat. And finally, the whole issue which I think is at stake here is the issue of representation. Uh, the poor in very many sociology circles and in global policy circles, particularly the urban poor who live in shanty towns are now seen as resources, seen as creative. And of course they give, they gave, they, are, they have come up with a very creative culture. The whole musical form rap came to us from the slums of New York. And now, of course, it's been appropriated by the well-off whites, but it actually came up as a mood of protest. Graham Greene's a comedian. There's a very interesting sentence. He says, we should provide soup kitchens, which is the heart of the capital city. And the protagonist mm -hmm. says, the heart of the capital city is a shanty town. So in a way to glamorize the way these people have made their own lives, they build our cities, a city which has no place for them, is to actually do them disservice because we do not recognize they live under probably the reign of a slumlord. I mean, uh, and of, of, of gangsters, the drugs and all kinds of terrible things happening. It is time we paid attention to the formation of the city. But the problem is migrants, which form majority of the urban poor, have no vote where they work. There is no representation. Trade unions have representation, but trade unions are 6% of our working class. How about looking at the representation and about, you know, the politicians only go to them at times of elections. They don't look at them and it's time the urban poor started having some form of representation we start recognizing. Perhaps if all this was done, we would avoid the kind of centralization that took place. And instead of looking after the most vulnerable sections of your people, what do you talk about Atam Nirbhar Bharat? And finally, most finally, we have to recognize that there's a distinct shift in official policy. The policy is not no longer to give jobs. The policy is the entrepreneurial self. You want a job, you create jobs. You sell pakoras or you do whatever you want to do, but don't ask the government for jobs. And this has become very clear in the last budget. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, Neera's actually um, in the process of unraveling this, this um, bewildering word, the poor, um, she's focused on policy and that's what I was hoping you would do in fact, Neera. And I thought from there, if we move on to Hilal with the human costs, um, of course there's a direct relationship between policy and human costs, the shortcomings or the failures of the government and human costs. But uh, we also have the contract that citizens have with each other. 
And uh, I think the lockdown showed us, of course, the old fault lines, um, the uh, ability to not look at large, large sections of people. But perhaps what was even more alarming, um, arguably, was uh, stigma, the stigma attached to anybody who got COVID, the assumption that uh, Harsh has a lot of very, very poignant anecdotes about. The assumption that it would be your security guard or your domestic help, or in other words, a different class that has brought COVID into the uh, city, into the colony, and will spread it. Mm? So a class thing. Then you also, of course, the idea of social, that unfortunate phrase, social distancing, um, which is, is, is sort of like a, a dream come true for a casteist society. And then of course, the Corona Jihad. So it's, it's uh, entire swathes of people, uh, the usual suspects in, in fact, who are excluded. So it's not just that the middle class saw migrants learned that there are migrant workers, a terrible phrase again, uh, as if they have no home. Uh, so it's as if the middle class was seeing them for the first time, uh, an artificially homogenized group. So this is a rather long uh, and fat question for you, Hilal. But I think if you begin attacking it, then everyone can have a turn at discussing it. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Geeta. First of all, uh, thank you very much, uh, Center for Equity Society News Click, and above all, Harshvai, for uh, giving me this opportunity to may not merely to read the book, but to reflect on it. It's a wonderful book. And uh, as a reader, I can read it in two different ways. One is as a strong statement on the state of uh, our public life. And second is, and that's, that's, the, that's the important point which I would like to underline to link the question, the long question which you ask, uh, about uh, a specific intellectual exercise which he undertook. And what is interesting in this intellectual exercise is a very, very structured methodological premise to construct a very moving and informed set of arguments. And in my view, these arguments uh, need actually force us to think more critically about three, more, three very broad questions. The first question in my view is that of the nature of existing power structure. Uh, I am glad Professor Chandok uh, very, very categorically and very clearly point out the difference between charity and equality. And this is something I just want to you know, underline that we have now an official doctrine called New India. And there is, if you, if you, if you visit Prime Minister Narendra Modi's website, uh, this doctrine of New India <clears throat> has got a pledge. And this is a nine point pledge. And one of the point is, that I, if I want to contribute to name new India, I should be a job creator, not a job seeker. It simply means that if you ask a job, you can legitimately be called anti-national. So the first point is the nature of power structure now has got, a, the nature of power structure is completely changed and legitimized with this doctrine called new India. And therefore, uh, the question of class is something which is being legitimized very powerfully. So uh, Hajbai's book actually point, led us to unpack this idea of new India and the, the nature of existing power structure. The second aspect and the second broad question this book poses, at least for me intellectually, is that it forces us to unpack the idea of people because it is, it has been, you know, all of us, we are saying that we the people, but these people need to be critically evaluated. And this is the central answer uh, to the question you pose is that this uh, idea of people has got three very interesting meaning that have come up in last 10 to 12 years, not merely when BJP won the election, but before that, the first idea of people is common man, Amadmi. And this Amadmi is something, it is a homogeneous entity. You need not to disaggregate it. You, you need to just focus that Amadmi, who is rational, who is uh, very intelligent, and who would always take good decisions. 
Now, the second feature of this people is that of rational voter. So in the name of rationality of politics, you legitimize majoritarianism. And finally, uh, the third point about this idea of people is taxpayer. We are categorically told time and again that we all are survive on taxpayer money. Poor are surviving on taxpayer money. So this idea of people, this book, at least for me, unpack it and force us to rethink that this rational construction of a homogeneous idea of we the people is problematic and therefore there is a need to deconstruct it. And finally, uh, the final chapter of the book, which is very moving chapter, but also raises a crucial question about uh, the vacuum of political ideas, the vacuum of imagination of a good society. On the one hand, we have official, you no, know, everything is somehow revolving around uh, the idea of constitution. And therefore, the, the final chapter is focusing us, what, the, what is the meaning of constitution? Are we simply saying that constitution is a law book which we need to follow? Or are we saying what Ambedkar used to call political morality? Do we need to construct a new political morality? I think there is a vacuum of political ideas. This book is actually directing us to think critically the imagination of a good society and good polity. So this is something which you know uh, I feel very provocative about the book, which forces us to think very critically about who we are and what and in, in what form we think of a future polity and future society. Uh, you know, there is a related question uh, in your long uh, question, spe specifically about Muslims in India. I think that it is important to uh, revisit this anti-Muslim uh, discourse, not directly, because this is what uh, the dominant power structure want us to do, that we should treat Muslim and Hindu as homogeneous entity uh, in, a in a binary relationship, etc. So I think that it would be better if we avoid that binary and think critically about the ways in which anti-Muslim discourse, especially Corona Jihad, produced. And I find four, uh, a four-level structure that produces that discourse. At the bottom level of society, you have got very specific incidences, and Hashbai recorded a number of incidences when Sabziwala's is dropped, etc., uh, where a person, a security guard, or you know, was alleged because he was a Muslim, etc. So these are the these are very uh, you know these are uh, the incidents which are there at the bottom level of society. But the second level is the media level, where a section of media actually legitimized that discourse as if that. This is the dominant interpretation prevailing in the society. The third level is the middle level. The third level is where the middle level BJP leadership and the RSS leadership exist. This leadership legitimized media discourse while responding to them positively. And finally, at the top level, there is a strange silence. Modi did not, did not you know, uh, I can say with full confidence that I have read Mr. Modi's at least 80% of speeches which are there on his, his website. But he only used the word Muslim at least two or three times. So there is a strange silence there. So he won't, you know, create. So in my view, that strange silence produced some kind of an effect. And this effect is, you know, it's, it's diluted at the bottom level and create an anti-Muslim discourse. So when a very small incident, say, happened, it, it would become very easy for media, for, uh, you know, for uh, newspapers, et cetera, to translate that into Hindu-Muslim binary. So that structure is constantly producing uh, anti-Muslim uh, narrative in contemporary times. I stop here. Thank you. That was a very uh, rich answer with multiple strands. But I'm going to pick up um, uh, what you said about uh, reason. Uh, and and um, I'm, I'm sorry, I know I threatened to go spontaneously all over the place, but I'm going to do it in the same order, because especially because Vinay spoke of um, the commonalities uh, between India and other parts of the world. Uh, of course, I have the United States in mind right now uh, when talking about science and reason. Um, in the Indian context, uh, there is a rather odd juxtaposition of this 
completely being in thrall of the digital, including uh, government assistance uh, during the uh, pandemic, um, uh, during the lockdown, all coming via, say, the smartphone, of course, education also uh, via the smartphone or, you know, in places where you don't have internet or the signal or whatever. So on the one hand, this, this um, uh, uh, you know, uh, obsession with the digital, but on the other hand, uh, uh, informally, without their names being mentioned, uh, a lot of the scientific advisors have actually gone on record to say that um, what they said about the hasty, unprepared lockdown, what they said about uh, the kind of preparation that should go, that didn't take place. And plus, of course, there were the uh, slightly crazy things that the middle class uh, 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 responded to this irrational framework of clapping and switching off lights and standing in the balcony and, you know, all that sort of thing, uh, which we can't just smile at because that was a kind of official response, uh, which the people participated in, at least the middle class did. So, Vinay, if you could, um, we must, uh, I don't know about the United States, but we do have some talk of scientific temper in our, um, uh, in our constitution. So, you know, if you could, if you could talk about this. Uh, I'm happy to do so, uh, but if you'll allow me, I just also want to pick up a few of the threads because the discussion has really become very wide ranging. Um, and there's something that Hilal had said, a couple of things he said that I think that I want to sort of pick up on and then, I, then I'll come to the question of uh, uh, science and rationality. Uh, so here is a problem I want to pose to Harsh because uh, the point I want to pick up on is a point that uh, Hilal had made with reference to the last chapter of the book, which is also the piece that came out in the India Forum, uh, A Moment for Civilizational Introspection. Okay, and, and perhaps my framing of it will not agree, not everyone will find agreeable, but I hope you see the thrust of it. To explain what the question really is, let me just take the liberty, Harsh, of telling a story because your book also tells stories. And it's really in some ways both, uh, it's a tool that social scientists don't very often use actually. Um, I think you use it in almost all of your books. The story very simply is this, that you know, in the 1920s, Tagore went to China uh, so there's a whole series of talks he gave, published as talks in China. And one of these talks that he gave, he describes that, this is 1920s, he describes that he had taken a trip outside Calcutta. He was about 100 kilometers outside Calcutta in his automobile. The area that he was going through was completely drought stricken. There was virtually no water to be found there. And the car started overheating. Now, when the car overheats, the only way to really address a problem, unless you have a mechanic at hand, uh, which was not the case in the Bengal countryside in the 1920s, is you pour water. Now, there's virtually no water to be had. But the village that he stopped at, you know, they found a little bit and they gave it to him, even though they didn't have any water to drink for themselves. 10 kilometers further along, the same problem occurs, then the same problem, and every time he gets a little bit of water. Now Tagore says that he's trying to understand how these people could be so generous. Because that, you see your book is one of the motifs is this question of, let's use a word that, that Nira had invoked in a different way, charity, because this is not charity that we're speaking about, but we have to look at cognate terms and what the meaning of this is. And you'll see the, the relevance to the point I want to really push here. So he says that, look, if an American businessman had been here, he would have hiked up the price a hundred times. He says these villagers, the reason they gave the water is because they understood that it was their dharma. That this is part of the dharma of a people, this ethic of hospitality, all right? One of your arguments in the book, although you don't use this phrase, is that we have become a republic of inhospitality, if I may put it this way, all right? Now, here's the question for you. You see, I think the problem for me is that if you're going to speak about a civilizational framework or what Hilal is calling a good society, but your framework is really a civilizational framework that you want to, then you need a civilizational language for it. 
I would submit to you, you don't have it in this book. Rights is not the language of civilization. It's the language of the nation state. It has a very particular relationship to the birth of the nation state and how the nation state developed from the 17th century onwards. The civilizational framework speaks of dharma. That is one fundamental difference between Gandhi and Ambedkar. I won't get into that right now. That the, the language of dharma was completely opaque to Ambedkar, completely. All right. But I won't get into that because it's a very large question, but it really is a question that I think you'll have to address because you cannot really enter into the idea of a good society from a civilizational framework and use the language of the nation state. That's what I'm saying to you because it does not resonate in India at all, in my view, all right? Now we get to the question of scapegoating and then I'll get to the question of science. I completely agree, for example, Harsh with what you've said and I think Hilal had also mentioned that as well. I mean, it's obvious, right? That people have been, it's obviously Northeasterners and most obviously, of course, Muslims. But here again, the question of, we'll have to ask what is particular about the Indian way in which we think about it. Because I'm living in Los Angeles, I can tell you there is an astronomical increase of anti-Asian violence in the entire United States in the last one year, astronomical increase. And you, you don't have to be Chinese, you could be a Korean, Filipino, Japanese, Korean, they all look the same from the point of view of the white American. They're all Chinese, you know, right? right? So, and scapegoating has a very old history. During the Black Death, Jews were constantly scapegoated. I won't go over the whole history of it. It's very common in epidemic diseases, especially, to actually scapegoat a particular community, all right? So here again, my summation simply is this. I want to understand what, what are the ways in which we are inflecting that idea when we think about it? Because it's much too easy simply to say it's happening. Yes, I know it's happening, but how do we actually really think of the ethical implications and what is particular about it in a particular place? All right. Now, when we get to the question of science, I think the matter again is really very complex. Why? Because Number one, I think on the coronavirus pandemic in particular, frankly, the scientists don't know very much either, if you ask me. You, you, can, you can look at the history of epidemic disease and you can actually look at coronaviruses. I mean, the countries that have actually been successful, I mean, uh, uh, Harsh makes an uh, argument, many people have made it. I have a lot of reservations about, you know, our countries that are led by women, leaders more successful. I don't think there's much to it, frankly, if you ask me. Germany has been very bad, frankly, in many ways. Um, and I can tell you the, the reasons why New Zealand has succeeded. Vietnam would have been a very interesting case of a country which is not talked about, which has been far more successful because its density of population is 20 times greater than that of New Zealand. And they have a fatality rate which is lower. Okay, their population is 100 million. New Zealand is 6 million. Let's not forget that, all right? The real question here is, it's not that New Zealand is following the science and other countries are not. Some countries are, some are not. And the ground on which we understand science is shifting very rapidly. Even this, even the idea of social distancing and the six feet rule is something that actually has been disputed. There are epidemiologists who will tell you it should be more like 40 feet, okay? And this six feet real, rule is, is a rule that goes back to the WHO and to the work of an American scientist going back to the 1930s, all right? That's what it really goes back to. But if you look at it in the larger context, let's look at it this way. See, if you look at, for example, the opposition to vaccines, all right? Because here again, there is a scientific consensus that we should all take it. And, there, and I suspect that all of us who are in this here, whether as panelists or as listeners, will take it. But there are a large number of people 
across a wide spectrum of countries with very different levels of literacy, very different levels of court development, who are refusing the vaccine. India is one of those countries where there's a lot of suspicion, but that so is the case in the US. So is the case in France, 40% in France, okay? Now, I think it would be far too easy to say that all of these people are simply people who are resisting science or they're, they're lunatics or they believe in conspiracies. And in America, the liberals will tell you this is knee-jerk Republicans, they believe in QAnon, you know, they're wackos, all of that. All of that may be true. I'm not suggesting that there isn't something there, but I think the matter is more complex. Why is it more complex? Because what's interesting is that after 500 years of when science has been supposedly hegemonic in some fashion or the other, there is still a deep pervasive sense in which people are suspicious of science. Therefore, we have to understand what is a hermeneutics of suspicion regarding science. What are the ways in which it does not speak to certain parts of ourself, okay? And I think we'll have to understand that in order to understand why people are resisting it. I can tell you that when the smallpox, smallpox vaccine came along, there were over a thousand pamphlets issued against Edward Jenner, okay? And many of them come not simply from a religious standpoint. They come from all kinds of standpoints, including this idea of what you might call an inherent suspicion of authority. Because again, you see, the administration of vaccines involves the state. That's why I go back to my question, point about the state. The, the state and the government are two different things. What the BJP government does is one thing. The question here is a much longer lasting question about how we think about the state in any society, right? I, I could go on in this vein for a long time, but this would be one of the ways in which I would think about some of these questions. Thank you. Um, I, I actually want, I'm not terribly sure whether we're going to end at 1.30. I'm hoping Harsh or uh, somebody from the organizers will let us know. Uh, because uh, I'm going to do a, a, a pair of questions for Anira and uh, Hilal, not only responding to, of course, what we've all been saying, all kinds of things, uh, but to come back to the specific of the middle class, um, and of course, we should be talking about the middle class because that's where we are located. Did, uh, Neera, do you think the middle class took its cues from the government in a sense? It was a kind of acceptance of the government framework and the um, uh, those who did the planning who clearly, uh, uh, we're not going to get into their motives, but they were only looking at the middle class to say, stay at home, there's that Lakshman Rekha and, um, you know, wash your hands uh, thoroughly and you know, all this kind of thing, uh, as Harsh points out, you know, sort of out of touch with uh, Indian realities. Uh, so do you think the middle class actually took a cue uh, um, from the, the government uh, uh, framework and felt that, well, if we follow the rules, if we are like good team players, uh, our role is done. Um, because, you know, I think we have to go beyond this kind of breast beating and saying mea culpa for the entire class. What is it that made people think that that was enough? Uh, so that is one question. But what I want to pose to everybody, and I will come last to Harsh, is also uh, when I've spoken about vaccines, what is the what are your suggestions for sort of vaccines in the form of strategies to uh, to ensure that what we saw over this last year is not repeated at the same level? What are the strategies for? Um, uh, academics, for citizens, for right, you know, uh, for students, for activists and so on. So, Neera. I said your questions have a very deep bearing on what Vinay said. And without kind of seeming to criticize them, I don't want to criticize you, Vinay. I just want to add a footnote to what you said. So maybe we could have a conversation. The first thing is that the whole notion of science, which has come up and, um, 
you know, it is a, it's a product of the 19th century and its positivistic mentality when science came to be identified with the natural sciences with precision and measurability and verification and so on and so forth. Why don't we go back to the Greek notion of science as knowledge? Greeks looked at science, you know, in forms of knowledge, a body of knowledge. When you have a certain, I hesitate to say expertise, but you have a fair amount of control over what you are talking about and therefore you put your learning out, but you're always willing to enter into a conversation because you know that knowledge is imperfect, our knowledge is imperfect, and this is the basis upon which both Socrates and Gandhi built their notion of tolerance. I may remind you that Gandhi actually translated Plato's Apology, which deals with the trial of Socrates. And there Socrates says, I know I'm wiser than others, because at least I know I don't know. I mean, that is one thing I think it's time for all of us to be aware of. So one is the whole notion of science. But yes, in a positivist sense, there is we, have, we saw a very peculiar uh, dual mentality. On the one hand, I live in a middle class colony and my neighbors were banging their thalis on the day and the time the prime minister had asked them to do it. So saying coronavirus go away. At the same time, everyone is rushing for vaccination. I'm one of them who has got vaccinated. Hopefully it will control um, my life, uh, the future of my life. That is one thing. It's the way that most of the concepts that we took, uh, we deal with today are actually products of the 19th century and positivism. And nobody said this, um, you know, you have to look at philosophers in order to understand it. The second, how do we build a good society? You know, Hilal, I've known Hilal for years, um, but, Maybe we should lower our expectations and say, let's build a decent society. You know, in our caste-ridden communalist society, yeah, it's enough we don't humiliate each other. Good society, let's leave it to Socrates and Plato, because that requires too many complicated concepts like Swaraj, which bother me, because I really don't know where anybody knows what Swaraj means, the way at least Gandhi used it. It was too much like Isaiah Berlin's positive liberty. It often strikes me and here I'm going to enter into a bit of, uh, Vinay, please take me, you know, in the positive sense. Positive, I don't mean positivistic, but in the, just a footnote to what you say. You know, we often forget that when the British came to India, the British who colonized India were not Catholics, they were Protestants. They were metaphysical, they were abstract, Protestantism. And out of the six schools of Indian philosophy that they chose to privilege in terms of translation and in terms of seeing it as def definitive of Hinduism, for, for the British, India was Hindu. That we have to accept that, particularly after 1857, was the Vedanta. And Dharma is a concept of Vedanta. <clears throat> now, the notion of, you know, Vedanta is metaphysical, it's abstract, it's also very upper caste. You know, it is absolutely, the, the, it's a Brahmanical virtue. And your dharma, sorry, but I have to say this, is guided by your caste. No, it often strikes me that two streams of philosophy that were completely marginalized by the British, one was Samkhya philosophy, the sage Kapila, which is rationalistic and materialistic. Look, when you die, you die. So you finish that your physical body is over, no rebirth. Okay. The second is Charvak. Now, Pradeep Gokhale has done a wonderful book in said, Charvak is probably the most critical of philosophies. We identify Charvak with, you know, having a good time, but that's not what Charvak is about. There is no text you rely upon. If philosophy is the art of constantly engaging with your world critically, it's Charvak that gives us an insight how to do so. Suppose we had adopted Charvak as a national public philosophy of the freedom struggle, would we be ha have been more sensitive to the inequalities of our society than the Vedantic notion, which Vivekananda in Chicago says, the West is materialistic, we are spiritual. We rest very happy with this whole notion, right? I remember Kapilaji once saying, Kapilavad Sain saying, yes, we are spiritualistic, but also very materialistic. A society that worships money, which other society do you see holding money to their forehead? whether you give it to a shopkeeper or whether you have Diwali. A society which is so materialistic is very happy in the vanity that we are spiritualistic. We practice all these values. 
and to hell with the rest of our society, our own people, we are completely insensitive to inequalities. We are completely sensitive, insensitive to deprivation. Finally, I may say, you know, Suma, uh, Madhu, Sumi Madhuk, who's a professor now in LSC, has done a very interesting uh, book on Huck, where she says, why don't we use the word Huck? And the only time I did some field work was in the people who had been thrown out by the Narmada Valley, the Adivasis. They didn't choose the word Adhikar. We had gone to them with constitutional rights. They used the word Huck, but Huck is not right. Huck is entitlement. Now, how in a caste-ridden society we are going, I already see something in the question and answers on caste, right? In a caste-ridden society, we are going to give everybody their Huck is I think the biggest issue that we have to face. We have to look at our own philosophy, but we also have to look at the way we adopt the kind of philosophy that was translated, interpreted, and privileged by the British and by Protestantism. Um, you know, the, the, um, another Kumara Swami once said in his introduction to the translation of the Vedas, he, he has written, he said, the problem with the translators were not that they were not good translators. They were philologists. They knew the meaning of a term and they were positivists. They were not Catholics, at least Catholics worship forests and they believe in fasts and they flagellate each other and themselves when there is, you know, much more in common with what believe. They have a notion of metaphysics that goes beyond the purely abstract. So in a way, maybe we should start critically looking at the public, policy, public uh, ethics that are nationalist struggle. And I really, I thought Vivekananda, and this, the final thing that Vivekananda did, which bothers me, I'm not denying Vivekananda his genius, but to colonize Gautam Buddha, to colonize Buddhism and say Gautam Buddha is the eighth avatar, or for God's sake, Buddhism was a philosophy that criticized the Vedanta. It was not, it, it is not a uh, Vedantic philosophy. It criticized, there were schools within the Vedantic philosophy that criticized the uh, codification of the four Vedas and that was Samkhya. Maybe we should start looking at philosophies that allow us to be more sensitive to our human beings. I'm afraid, I'm from Punjab, we thought we didn't believe in caste. This social distancing business actually reinforced how much we believe in caste. I'm, I, I, I'm saying this with a great deal of regret. I thought I was different to my grandmother. I'm not, I'm, my society is not. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Neera. I can see that we might need several sessions uh, uh, to, to have, um, you know, conversations at different levels. But I'm, uh, I see a couple of uh, interesting questions as well. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, both Hilal and Harsh uh, to give me their take, um, Hilal first uh, possibly, and then Harsh tying it all together on this very specific, not so much the philosophical, which is important because that constructs the framework, but what are some of the specific strategies um, you know, Hush's book uh, has a sense of immediacy. It makes you want to, um, to go out and do something. Um, so I think uh, that is what we should be talking about now. What are, uh, whether it's in terms of idea or action, uh, what are some of the vaccines that we can produce? First of all, uh, I think that uh, I agree uh, Professor Chandok's uh, argument in relation to positivism and science. So I think she has partly answered uh, that question. What I'm going to say about, uh, in terms of ideas, I think that why I like the book, that is important here. Uh, I like it because in a way, this book is forcing all of us to go beyond what is here. So uh, the question is what ought to be is a very puzzling question. Now, uh, when we say what ought to be or uh, what I say a good society or what Professor Chandok says um, about a decent society, I don't think that there is a uh, disagreement in that. Uh, but what ought to be is a question uh, which we need not to define. Rather, we conceptualize it in a way 
to think critically what really is at the moment, what exists. And then if we are critical about it, then there is a possibility to, you know, translate the action which we take and then think <clears throat> about the possible moral framework which uh, we might evolve. Having said that, coming to the very practical issue, uh, for example, if you look at uh, lynching, lynching of Muslims. Now, uh, as a <clears throat> political scientist, uh, and I'm doing political ethnography, etc. Uh, my obvious way to uh, raise this question, not to the person who is actually a victim of that. Rather, I would go to, the, to a person who was involved in it. And then I would ask this person, what really provokes him or her to be part of that very act? Uh, I wrote a long piece on Gujarat violence. And uh, unlike others, I uh, am not interested in glamorizing what I usually call Muslim victimhood. Rather, I am interested in competitive victimhood. And in the framework of competitive victimhood, and there's a lot of literature, by the way, and I'm working on that, that what is competitive victimhood meaning that every segment of society would come <clears throat> and say that I'm a victim. And because the majority, if we, if we divide that in a conventional sense in majority and minority, uh, the, the, the powerlessness of minority is always legitimized in relation to the imagined powerlessness of majority. So the moral uh, gap between these two, means the moral uh, gap between the majority and minority is filled up with this imagination that we are also victims. Look at the film Padmavat. Uh, so you may find that in the past, there is a, there is a Hindu victimhood and that victimhood is somehow, uh, is, is still there. Muslim God Pakistan, we all know that. Muslim God Pakistan, uh, they also got some kind of minority rights, etc. And therefore we Hindu as a majority, despite being the major majority in this country are facing a number of threats. Actually. So that would create some kind of a competitive victimhood. Now, for, uh, as a political scientist, I would go to a person and ask that, how would you think after being part of an act of violence, what is your morality? And what is Hindutva's morality? Now, uh, my final point is about uh, a series of lecture, uh, which Mohan Bhagwat ji gave last year, last to last year, 2018. He gave three lectures for the first time on the concept called Hindutva. By the way, we must remember that uh, Hindutva uh, is not RSS's uh, concept. It was Savrakar's concept. And RSS actually inherited this concept very recent, inherited this concept very recent. Now, Mohan Bhagwat ji gave three lectures on that. And in the final day, the three days thing, in the final day, this question of Hindutva's morality also came up and he evaded this death. Now, the point is that we are not asking these sort of questions. These are uncomfortable questions. We always go to the people who are actually victim of that. Rather, I think that's very important that we should ask these questions to the people who are uh, appreciating the power structure, the state's narrative and imbibing it. So until and unless we analyze them, we won't be able to understand what we call popularity of the regime, etc. So therefore, the final point is that we need to critically think what is and then evolve uh, some kind of an imagination of a good society. I would stick to that. What could be the possible ways to create a good society? Thank you. Thank you so much, Hilal. Though I think uh, uh, some of us might want to argue that uh, one of the new developments we've noticed in recent times has been that the perpetrators, uh, if I may call them that, of um, what we think is is you know uh, stigmatizing people for who they are, uh, all the way up to violence and lynching. Um, they are um, quite happy 
to to explain their philosophy, uh, if I can uh, <laughs> use a word like that, on social media and so on. So um, I I'm not very sure whether uh, this kind of conversion of the heart. Uh, is is something that, uh, of course, has been tried before in India and whether it will work. But this is, of course, uh, we all of us need to meet and, and discuss these things again. I thought uh, if we can tie it up with um, Harsh, um, I'm going to be emboldened by Vinay disagreeing with you and not so much to disagree, but to say that I would be, um, uh, I'm a little puzzled by the phrase, moral center, it, it uh, gut level, it sounds very good to me. I'm not terribly sure what it means. Um, uh, if you could, perhaps if you speak very briefly about how we might heal this or restore the faltering moral center, we might actually understand what that is. So, Harsh. Thank you so much, Gita. And thanks uh, all of you, Vinay, Nira, Hilal, uh, I think you all made uh, wonderful points. I think this is a debate that is so critical that it, I hope we continue to, to have it uh, a, a, and agree, disagree, refine uh, many of the ideas. Um, you know, uh, to answer you, Gita, I mean, I've, I think there's one, there are about two central theses uh, among many that uh, I'm making. But the first is that the suffering that our working poor have faced over this last year and will probably continue to, uh, to have to endure and suffer and die, uh, you know, deprived of food, of education, of hope, of trust, uh, was not caused by the virus. It was not caused by the pandemic. It was the result of public policy, political choices. And those public policy, political choices were grounded on uh, uh, the, the choices, the social, political, ethical choices that the privileged in this country have made. And, and so I think that, that that's, that's my, and that's why I've called it a very, very strongly, what has happened, and I think as, as the years pass, must be recognized no less than a crime against humanity. These were a genocidal set of policies which will have destroyed the future for our most vulnerable people in the name of protecting them from the virus, which it never did, even in design. That, that is my first point. Uh, Arundhati Roy, uh, uh, you know, sometimes uses, often uses language in a very powerful kind of way. She said, COVID-19 was not just a virus, it was an X-ray. And it's an X-ray which has exposed to us who we are. And I'm saying it's not so much to me an X-ray of the state. I, I'm not, it's, uh, you know, the picture of uh, Mr. Modi feeding peacocks in his garden, changing clothes, at the very peak of the hunger crisis was not about Mr. Modi. It was about us and our celebration of a leader who could do that. And, and I think that it is that, uh, it, it's that X-ray of privileged, society in India uh, that, that I hope that our future discussions will, 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 will take us more and more. To Vinay, it's not a framework. I mean, a good state is not, I'm not conceptualizing it in a framework of rights, although I do believe and I've worked a lot for rights. Uh, because, but rights have often been reduced to a kind of legalese, a bureaucratic kind of uh, framework. We, we must be, you know, to, a good state for that, I think we have to go to much older ideas uh, of, of, of a much more, you know, universal is a strong word, but, but morality that has, you know, across civilizations, across periods of history. And maybe the morality of our constitution summarized in these four words, justice, liberty, equality, and most of all fraternity. Uh, I think that is uh, the good state that we are thinking about. You know, I, I, I sometimes, you know, we forget about what Mahatma Gandhi left us with. Uh, the talisman is well known. Uh, there was another conversation that he had, and I mentioned that very briefly first. Uh, Anis Kidwai, after her husband got killed during the partition riots, uh, didn't even go through her customary iddat and came to Gandhiji 
and said, I must do something for my country at this time. And she found him very, very, very saddened. And Gandhiji said, my work in Delhi will not be complete until a Muslim child cannot walk without fear in this city. My work is not complete. And how far we have come from there is something that I think all of us need to take, uh, you know, take responsibility for. The other, the talisman which he wrote when he was in Calcutta was, is better known. But I think that you know, when he said, when you're in confusion and doubt, think of the most vulnerable person that you've ever known or met and think of whether this is going to benefit that person. And I think that if, if our leaders had held this talisman even for those 10 minutes and then thought about whether they should go in for a nationwide lockdown with no relief and what would it do to that most vulnerable person, you could not have taken that decision. And I think that, that, that we've lost our way very badly. I've spent a lot of my, life, my working life before the IAS, within the IAS, after the IAS, NAC, and, and so on, fighting for a good state, as I understand it, a just and caring state. I'm reaching a point in my life, and I hope I have long enough to take this forward, is, to, is the recognition that a just and caring state can only be located in a just and caring society. And when we have problems with the state, we're pointing one finger there, there are three fingers that are pointing to us, our practice. And I think it is about our practice, uh, our philosophy, our imagination. I, I had many arguments when in the NEC with Dr. Manmohan Singh, uh, when he used to talk so passionately about markets. And I said, you know, let's, let's, let's accept the idea of a market economy, although I disagree with it. But can we have a new social contract can we debate a new social contract where whatever happens, there'll be a floor of human dignity below which no one will be allowed to fall. No child should sleep hungry. No child's body and brain should not be formed because they don't have uh, enough nutrition. Uh, no child should die because they don't have health care. No old person should have to work till her last day in order to have some food on her plate. We can debate these details. I think social housing is something that we'll have to think about, clean water for all. Uh, but, you know, uh, universal social rights of these kinds, if you want to use the language of rights, Prabhat Patnaik calculate and Joyati calculate it wouldn't cost more than 10% of our GDP. Uh, that is, you know, our tax to GDP ratio today is 14%. 24% would just bring us to the level of taxation of the United States. And this taxation should, should come through progressive taxing, of the, the super rich, a one and a half percent tax on the wealth and an inheritance tax would be more than enough to provide this entire set of, uh, of, of, of this floor of human dignity to all. So I, I think that, you know, what we're seeing if we have nine out of 10 workers who have no protection of work at all. And finally, the prime minister, when millions are on the streets, makes an appeal to the charity of their employers uh, which no one hears and, and is not enforced. What he forgot about, which amazes me even more, is that out of those nine out of those 10 workers, only 15% have an identifiable employer. Others go uh, to labor addas and have a new employer every day or are, 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 are people on the streets, uh, street vendors, etc. There's no imagination of this protection of, of and I thought that there would be a moment of shame, public shame, just for the record, we would say, we're going to now build a system of public health. But we have a budget where they claim we've increased by 200 something percent, and then we quickly find in their typical fashion, what they've done is water sanitation, et cetera, which was a separate head has been brought into this and the vaccine cost. And they've shown a massive increase in health expenditure. But if you take these out, you find they've actually reduced slightly. Uh, their, their investment in public health. Uh, they have withdrawn even the few uh, uh, legal rights of protection that uh, workers had in, this, in these months when we've seen all of this suffering. And this is being applauded by, by the large majority of us. I was watching uh, in wincing away uh, in a debate that I watched the last two days where Pranoy Roy in, on NDTV had got this galaxy of Nobel Prize winning uh, economists. And most of them said it was a wonderful uh, budget and it's going in the right direction. Yes, they have forgotten about the poor. Maybe they should have 
made some transfers to the poor. But you know, these are things. It is like that's by the way. But uh, but growth is the answer after all of this, and growth understood in a certain kind of way. So I uh, I think that you know we we need to say now we have to have a very strong public health system, including for urban areas. We must have labor rights uh, finally enforced for all our workers to start with. We must have. Uh, this floor of human dignity below which no one will be allowed to fall, and this will not happen until you and I in the middle class care about this enough. And 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 I'd like to just end. You know the ethic, ethical frameworks we can keep looking for. I like to quote uh, here uh, Prophet Muhammad just because he would be so little thought about at this moment. He was asked, uh, "What is your duty when you witness great suffering and injustice?" And he said, at the very least, respond from your heart. At the very least, feel the pain. The better among us respond from the tongue. We speak out against the injustice. The best of us respond with our hands, which is we act against this injustice. My problem with my country and my social class is that we don't even respond from our hearts. We don't care. Uh, we'll celebrate uh, when we're seeing. Such suffering and exclusion, because we are somehow feeling as long as we are protected, which is a false idea. I mean, I I I often said this, but when those buses were sent for the students in Kota, I was saying, could there have been one student, one student, who said because at that time when the migrants were you know were being transported in compartments at uh, at 38 degrees uh, truck containers and what 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 not. If there could have been one student who said, "I refuse to go home in this comfortable bus until the state provides these same facilities to every worker on the streets in this country," could we have had that one voice of solidarity? I think we've broken down as a people. We are among the most uncaring people in history, and therefore we are throwing up the kinds of governments we have. What's happening in the rest of the world? Maybe I'm not so well informed, but I do feel that the Indian middle class would probably get the award for the most uncaring people in the world. Harsh, uh, let me uh, supplement that with saying, as a as a kind of roundup, um, that in the last few years, and particularly in 2019. Uh, we heard three words from the preamble a great deal. We the people. Perhaps if we want to move as we must from the individual to the collective, um, we need to think of those three words again and again and see how that alters our day-to-day -day political practice. Uh, so I think caring needs to be supplemented. With um, uh, because you know individuals have different abilities and different ways of manifesting caring, but uh, what does it mean then for the collective or we the people? Um, there are some excellent questions. Uh, I see one uh, about caste and so on, um, and I must ask the participants to forgive us um, because we uh, began a little late. And uh, thank you all. for raising such important points clearly we need to say this is the beginning of the conversation and by no means are we even in the middle of it um may i ask natasha to play a video that we've been promised hum log 24 ghanta jo paidal chal chuke hain acha abhi tak na saab aur yahan se aapko andar jaane nahi de raha nahi de raha saab order ka paar nahi jaane ke liye de raha saab wo seedha prashasan seedha bol raha hai apni gaadi karke aap ja sakte ho apni gaadi ke bina aapko nahi jaane denge hum हमारे पास पैसा नहीं है सर हम कहाँ से जाएंगे अपने गाड़ी करके खाने के लिए भी नहीं है सर ये जो कार जो जाती है मारुति उसमें जो है तीन सौ पाँच सौ रुपया लेता है यहाँ से प्रत्येक आदमी से और वहाँ जाकर को छोड़ देता है चलता है चलो और मतलब कार में आप पार कर लो लेकिन पैदल पार नहीं कर नहीं साहब जाने के लिए नहीं दे रहा है जाने के बाद वहाँ गाली गुप्ता भी देता है पहला लॉकडाउन दूसरा लॉकडाउन तीसरा लॉकडाउन सरकार के जो वादे थे सरकार के जो आश्वासन थे वो सब इन्होंने देख लिया है ट्रेनों की कोशिश की बसों की कोशिश की हर वादा टूटता सा जा रहा है 
लोग मुनाफा बनाने की कोशिश कर रहे हैं कर आपने टेस्ट करा है सब कुछ है हमारे पास पूरा सबूत है साहब देख लेगा साहब सब कुछ देख लीजिए सब सब कुछ ऐसे प्रवासी मजदूरों के चिकित्सा जांच छान चीनी मिल क्या आपका वहाँ जांच जी साहब और किसी को बुखार वगैरह नहीं था नहीं साहब कोई कोई दिक्कत नहीं साहब हम छह लड़का हूँ सबका फिट 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 जी साहब सब कुछ हो गया मेरा आज ही हुआ है सर ये आज ही चेकअप हुआ है मैंने उनसे बात की कि सर मेरे पास तो सब सबूत है मैं तो चेकअप करा के आया हूँ अब देखिए कि भग जाए यहाँ से बहुत मारूंगा तुझे मैं सिलाई का काम करता हूँ मेरा ढाई महीने से काम बंद है सर प्रवासी मजदूरों की जो त्रासदी है वो खत्म होने का नाम ही नहीं ले रही है आज रात में हम दिल्ली में निकल रहे हैं और ये पा रहे हैं कि लोग बॉर्डर तक जा रहे हैं उत्तर प्रदेश उनको आ, घुसने की इजाज़त नहीं दे रही है उत्तर प्रदेश की पुलिस वही कठोरता से खड़ी हुई है एक ट्रक में कम से कम सौ बंदे भर देते हैं जो ट्रक में आप भी समझ सकते हैं सर बीस से पच्चीस बंदे बहुत हो गया हाँ हाँ। जिसमें सौ ले जाइएगा पच्चीस ले जाइए पचास ले जाइएगा मुश्किल है उससे मांगते पंद्रह सौ दो हज़ार रुपये किराया तो आप क्या करें मजबूरी में लोग जिसके वो दे के जाता नहीं तो पैदल ही चल रहे कितना हम लोग के पास एक रुपये नहीं पैदल ही चलेंगे ना अभी पुलिस वाले मार रहे डंडे भगा रहे बोल रहे कुछ नहीं होने वाला ना इधर के रहे ना उधर के रहे लोग बता रहे हैं कि फैक्ट्री के मालिकों ने उनको पैसा आज तक नहीं दिया है जितना उनके पास बचत थी आज तक उसको इस्तेमाल किया पूरा दिन लाइनों में खड़े हो के खाना खाया है कब तक इस तरह की ज़िंदगी वो जी पाएंगे हर मज़दूर अपने परिवार के साथ अपने घर जाने की कोशिश कर रहा है उनकी बातों को सुन के बेहद बेहद शर्मिंदगी के अलावा हम क्या महसूस करें कि हमने किस तरह का की सरकार किस तरह का समाज अपना बनाया दो महीना से बैठे कंपनी चल नहीं रहा है हमारे पास पैसा नहीं है खाने के पीने के लास्ट में हो जब ख़त्म हो गया पैसा तो चल दिए घर पर बहुत दुखी हो गए सर हम लोग क्या करें यूपी प्रशासन अंदर घुसने नहीं देते हैं गाली गालियाँ देने लगते हैं क्या करें हम लोग कहाँ जाएं यूपी के लिए कोई बस ही नहीं चलाई